Hey guys, what is up? John and Steph here from fly8mikealpha.com. Today, coming to you for private pilot stumper questions. Some questions that might stump you on your private pilot check ride. They'd probably stump me if I was going for my check ride today. Yeah. But luckily, we're watching this video, so you're not going to be stumped. Exactly. And luckily, the private pilot check ride is well behind both Stephanie and I. So, but for you, it might be upcoming. And this is all just a small part of what is online at flightmikealpha.com in both the private pilot written prep bootcamp as well as the private pilot check ride crash course, so aptly named. Uh, check out that course. The link is in the description below if you want to see more videos like this to prepare you for your private pilot check ride. We guarantee you will pass your check ride when you take that course. Everyone passes their check ride when they take that course. Yeah. It's a great course. All right, guys, let's jump into the first question. Okay. What RPM level would make you abort a takeoff due to not producing enough power? So I'm like going down the runway and... What RPM would you be seeing that would make you think, oh, this isn't really producing enough power, I should abort this takeoff? Well, if the RPM's too low, I wouldn't go. What would be too low? How do you know it's too oh, low? She's so tough, isn't she? Man. Well, you're going to have to refer to the type certificate data sheet, the TCDS, to find the specific minimum static RPM as well as maximum static RPM specified for your airplane. Unlikely that you're going to find it in the POH. So, on the type certificate data sheet on the FAA website, if you just type in, say, Cessna 172 TCDS, and then find the exact model of your Cessna 172 and verify that is the correct engine in there, so we'll have some engine models. Make sure that if it was built with 150 horsepower, that's what's on the type certificate data sheet, that's what's still on the airplane, so you know you're getting good data. And then verify that you have the right propeller on there, it'll have some propeller model numbers that are associated with that engine and it'll say for that engine and propeller combination, you should get between say 2350 and 2400 RPM static. So if it was below that minimal number, then I would abort the takeoff. Okay, sounds good to me. Yeah. All right, well then <laughs> I have a question for you. Okay. My question is, when we look at this airport here, it says uh, right on the sectional chart here, how long the runway is, it has that number there. So is that how long the runway is? Is that how much room you have available for landing? Well, in some instances, that is the amount of room that you have, but in other instances, there is a displaced threshold, which means that you have slightly less room to land. And you can use that threshold to take off, but not to land. So for example, the Sarasota airport says 95 there. Does that mean there's 9,500 feet available for landing? Not necessarily, and you would have to look at your chart supplement to know exactly how much room there is to land in each runway because that number only pertains to the longest runway of that airport. You might have multiple runways that are not all that length. Yeah, so in this case we can see Sarasota here. The pavement itself is 9,500 feet long. There's 9,500 feet of asphalt there, but whether you land north or south, or one, four, or three, two, you're not gonna be landing at the beginning of the runway. Both have displaced thresholds. Neither landing direction has a full 9,500 feet available for landing. It's actually a lot less than that. So checking that chart supplement, very good idea there. Okay, well, I guess it's your turn now to answer a question. Sure. And my question is, what is a hydroplaning, and how do you prevent that from happening, or how do you stop that from happening? All right, so hydroplaning is when we're touching down on say a paved runway uh -huh. and we have a lot of rain, a lot of standing water, perhaps it's still raining. So there's a film of water between our tires and the runway. And we touch down and our tires actually don't pierce through that water. Same way those cool guys on YouTube do it, water skiing down a river or a lake or something, spraying water everywhere. They're actually not in danger of diving down into the water unless they get slow enough at high speeds water acts like concrete and we actually can't pierce through the water with our tires. So although it's a not recommended and kind of a terrible idea to do that as a private pilot, what they're doing on YouTube, for us as private pilots, it's concerning to us because if we land on a very wet runway, our tires may not actually contact the pavement. We might be water skiing across that runway, just, you know, maybe a half inch above or a quarter inch above the actual tarmac surface, and we won't have any braking authority. 
So what would we do in that case? Well, we have to use the only braking authority we have available, in which case would be aerodynamic braking authority. So raise that nose, leave the flaps where they are, try to cause as much drag on the airplane as possible. The only way you're going to get those tires to pierce through that water and contact the pavement is to get the airplane slower. Once you are hydroplaning, you can hydroplane at a much lower speed even. So perhaps the minimum hydroplaning speed for that tire and tire pressure is maybe 40 miles per hour to start hydroplaning. So you land at 50, you're hydroplaning, but you could hydroplane even below that number since it's already begun. So once you do finally pierce through that water, you want to use light braking once there's contact between your tire and the pavement so that you're not skidding or potentially hydroplaning all over again. Aerodynamic braking is the only thing we have available to us to actually get the airplane slowed enough to then eventually start using brakes. So in the event we have a wet runway or it's raining or anything like that, I would always choose a longer runway than needed to land at. I would never be landing at say a 2,000 foot or 3,000 foot long runway. I might consider landing at a four or 5,000 foot long runway as a personal minimum, just because in my 172, if I was to hydroplane, I could burn up a lot of distance very quickly. And certainly managing my approach speed and energy, not touching down too fast, not coming in with too much speed will help that. Okay, that sounds really good. Awesome. So question for you then, Miss Examiner. <laughs> you don't get to ask the examiner many questions on the day you're check right, so this is kind of fun. <laughs> Let's say we're flying along. We've got this awesome radio stack here. We've got all these fancy cool buttons and we dial up the tower. We're coming in to land, oh, I don't know, maybe at the Punta Gorda Tower in Florida. And we're 10 miles out and we dial them up and we give them our whole spiel. Punta Gorda Tower, Cessna 12345, 10 miles north, landing with Juliet. And the tower comes back and says, aircraft calling Punta Gorda Tower, that was carrier only. What in the world do they mean by that? You're, are you gonna go land on an aircraft carrier? Not really. Um, have you ever heard sometimes when you're flying around, there's just sounds coming into your headset and it sounds like somebody's keying the mic, but nobody's talking. Well, oh, you mean like when a private pilot or when a student pilot keys the mic, makes a transmission, and then forgets to let go of the mic for another five or six seconds, and you just kind of hear breath on the frequency, or just that kind of somewhat static noise, or that electronic noise, right. but no one's talking? That so in noise? this case, you wouldn't even hear breath, because something is wrong, your, your voice is not coming through, but you're keying the mic, and so they're picking up that somebody's keying the mic and trying to talk, but no sound is coming through. So the radio carrier, the transmitting carrier is being transmitted, but not your voice. Yeah. So why would that occur? Well, there's a number of different issues. The most common one is if your mic jack is not plugged in all the way. So that would be the first thing to check. And then either way- Could it be that you were just flying along, singing out loud, kind of like you sing in the shower, and you actually have the microphone tilted up to the side, and so you made a radio call, but the microphone was so far away, nobody heard it, and they just heard the well, carrier? I usually have the microphone out of the way so I can eat snacks. Oh, yeah, or maybe you're eating snacks. Maybe <laughs> I like to kind of sing when I'm flying, but- Something like that. That could certainly cause it. So yeah, make sure the microphone's actually in front of your face. Make sure the mic jack's actually plugged in. Carrier only means that, yes, the transmit button is working, you're transmitting, but you're not actually transmitting any voice across the frequency. Now, is it your turn to ask me a question? I think so. My question is regarding ELT batteries, okay? Oh. And my question is... <laughs> somewhere in this book. I know the answer's in here. When are you supposed to replace an ELT battery? You're supposed to replace an ELT battery if more than 50% of the battery's useful life has been used up or calendar wise. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if it's been in operation for more than one cumulative hour. Okay, very good. Well, how do you know that it's been in operation more than an hour? I'm just gonna go ahead and tap myself out of this one. <laughs> That's a pretty tricky question. <laughs> How would I know if the ELT battery has been used for more than one cumulative hour since it was installed in the ELT and in that aircraft? There's not a clock on them. There's not a counter on it of any sort. All right, guys, that is five private pilot stumper questions for you for your private pilot check ride. A lot more stumper questions, many, many more online at flyatmikealp.com, all part of the private pilot check ride crash course that guarantees you will pass your check ride. Check it out. The link is in the description below for that course. If you have any questions on the questions we covered here, well, you can leave it in the comments below there or click on the ask a question tab at the top of the website at flyatmikealp.com. As always, guys, if you cannot fly every day, 
fly8mikealpha.com. We will see y'all in the next one. Good luck on your private pilot check ride.